here to present the Olive Festivals. Um, this is one of the first projects that uh, uh, we as demo architects uh, uh, completed. Um, this is also my own uh, house, uh, my second home in, in upstate New York, actually. Um, it's a pretty small uh, uh, house, approximately um, 1,500 square feet uh, interior, interior area, um, which has been certified passive house uh, this, uh, this past uh, July. Um, so I wanted to mention a little bit wh where I'm coming from uh, and, uh, and uh, my, my expertise or my experience uh, um, just to help, I guess it will help a little bit explain why I'm going to focus on certain details and, and certain aspects of the project. So grew up in Italy, um, studied in, uh, in Venice uh, and then moved first to Denmark uh, to work for the Arke Ingels Group. Uh, and then uh, with that company, I moved to New York uh, to continue working on um, um, via West 57, a large project in, uh, in New York City. Uh, while working on that project, I decided to actually change uh, my career and uh, started working for a curtain wall company um, and close. And uh, for five years, uh, I work on really, really large buildings, uh, uh, the complete opposite of this, uh, no lumber whatsoever, uh, just glass and aluminum and some steel here and there. Uh, so working on really, really detailed uh, uh, items on, on figuring out exactly how condensation can be uh, resolved uh, and, uh, and how manufacturing can be, uh, can be done uh, uh, off-site, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of uh, really technical expertise that uh, in 2019, when we decided to join forces with, uh, with, uh, with Daniel Kidd, he's uh, also in, the, in, in this call, um, came pretty helpful to actually accomplish some of, some of the project uh, and to actually show that uh, uh, despite being a uh, young office, we, we had uh, the knowledge and the ability to actually build things. So demo architects, so we have a lot of projects uh, uh, for the most part, except for my house and another house, uh, they're in construction because as uh, all of you are architect know, uh, it takes a lot of time to actually build some, a portfolio of, uh, of build projects uh, and, uh, and having started in 2019, definitely two years and not enough. Uh, but we're working on a lot of interesting projects and a lot of passive houses right now. So uh, for the most part uh, in, uh, in upstate New York. Um, so it's very exciting. Future looks uh, bright so far. So uh, this house. So in 2017, my wife and I uh, decided to start looking for a land and build a house. The idea was that, uh, well, we couldn't afford an apartment in New York City or nothing that uh, bigger than a studio. So we're like, why not looking for land, building something bigger? It's an investment. Uh, it's going to be a fun project. And, uh, and maybe one day we'll move there. So we look for a million, uh, through a million land and then finally we saw this uh, uh, beautiful piece of property, which of course was twice our budget, uh, but we fell in love with it and we decided, oh, okay, let's just buy it and see uh, what we can do with it. And this, just, so, just to orient yourself a little bit, uh, uh, this is not really a view that I get most of the time. This is more like from the neighbor uh, because my house is on this side. So I don't really see the mountain, but I actually have a south exposure and a view of, uh, of the palm. So after camping on, uh, uh, on the property uh, for quite some time and being Italian, I cannot uh, uh, not have my mocha, uh, even on a campsite. Uh, we finally decided where to put the house uh, and we finally conceived an idea for, uh, for, the, for the house. Um, so this is the final product uh, and I kind of want to step back a little bit and talk about uh, how we, we, we got here. Um, so the idea was to have like a really basic house, uh, uh, really, really simple, the, the, the kind of house that a kid will, uh, will draw, like the one on the right, or that an artist uh, that tries to draw as a kid, like Paul Klee, uh, would, uh, would draw. So really basic element, uh, uh, vertical walls uh, and a pitch roof. Of course, this is nothing new. Uh, a lot of architects uh, these days, especially are trying to use this archetype of a, of a house for new construction. Uh, for example, the, the Vitra house by Herzog de Meron. Uh, the idea, however, was to uh, take this, uh, this volume and in a way like similar to a geode uh, or similar to the way that a beaver uh, kind of carves uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a very interesting way, uh, the, uh, the exterior of a, of, a, of a tree to reveal its, uh, its warmer interior, uh, we decided to carve the volume. Once again, nothing new. Uh, I haven't invented anything. I know that. Uh, Stephen Hall is definitely a master in that and, and uh, uh, really a an architect I really like and, and both these buildings in a way have something very similar to what we've been trying to do with the, uh, with the Olive Pass house. So the idea for these uh, carvings uh, on, the, on the building uh, 
was to actually justify them in a way that was uh, relating the building to the site and also in a way that could uh, organize uh, the interior and exterior space. Uh, so the house is oriented uh, 30 degrees southeast. Uh, it's kind of like the maximum angle we could put it at uh, in order to still get some view of the pond uh, and uh, not miss on the, on the sun exposure towards the south. Uh, at the same time, uh, on, the, on the south here, there's the only neighbor uh, is in sight. Of course, they have a view of the pond there. Uh, so we kind of wanted to maintain some privacy still like very far, but nonetheless, I wanted to maintain some privacy and not really uh, point the view directly onto, onto the neighbor house. So what we decided to do uh, is to carve out uh, this uh, um, wedge shape uh, out, of, uh, out of the house, out of this very simple volume uh, at an angle of 23 degrees from, uh, from the actual uh, axis of the, of the house in order to orient the view directly onto, uh, onto, the, onto the pond uh, so that the, this interior space that is actually sitting on, on that side of the house can look straight out onto, onto the water without, any, uh, without seeing the neighbor and without the neighbor seeing inside the house. Uh, what that translates to is uh, uh, this angle, this 23 degree angle again that uh, because of this cutout onto the south volume creates this uh, odd shape uh, onto, onto the, the volume itself with a big uh, glass window that again looks over to the pond. Uh, this cutout also kind of continues underneath here, creating a, a cover porch on the south side, which is perfect for, for dining, uh, for working, et cetera. And then it continues on the, on the east side with an outdoor shower and, uh, and the condenser unit. Um, up, um, upstairs uh, uh, and at the entrance, uh, this cutout also creates a, a, little, uh, a little recess uh, for a cover entrance. And then this angle orients the stairs, a mechanical room, uh, and this loft uh, upstairs that looks down onto the, the double height uh, living room space. Uh, the idea of this geode or the idea of, 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 of a beaver uh, chewing through a trunk um, it's kind of what we try to express with the house. The house is this very well protected shed that is, that is a, a black steel, uh, very simple shape. And then every time we carved out uh, an opening, we revealed the warmth of the interior through the use of wood as a, as a siding material. So the result, as you can see, Again, very simple volume. And then every time we cut out, uh, whether it's the entrance, uh, uh, balconies, uh, uh, the, the porch, et cetera, et cetera, it reveals a very warm uh, interior. So now onto the construction. So the construction of this house uh, from, from day one, and probably because of I, I came from uh, uh, the curtain wall uh, industry, uh, I, I wanted to use a prefabricated technique. So the house is actually a panelized system. Um, I talk with the usual uh, names uh, uh, in the industry, Benson Wood, uh, EcoCore, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then eventually I found out uh, a small uh, company in, uh, in Kingston, uh, Threshold Builders. Uh, they had uh, just started uh, uh, building panels uh, um, with the PGI outriggers. Uh, and then spec cellulose, building passive houses. Uh, uh, they've only, unfortunately, after this house, uh, because of pandemic uh, and uh, the, the true partner of this company uh, took different paths uh, and they're not, no longer in business, uh, but they did a great job in building these panels in the factory. I'm gonna talk about exactly how they're detailed. Um, so you can see, um, sorry. So all the panels were built and then uh, over the span of, uh, of a couple of months, and then the construction for the most part for all the ground floor, everything and the second floor, everything except the, um, the roof uh, was installed uh, in a span of, uh, of three days. So this is a camera that I set on, on site. Uh, so you can see uh, setting of the panels. It's not going very smooth, but it's, it's happening. Um, so all the panels, uh, there we go, second day. Again, all the panels were prefabricated in Kingston, which is roughly 25 minutes drive from uh, the project site. Uh, so really close by, not a lot of travel distance. Uh, uh, so build locally in a way. Um, and there you see the big beam over the, uh, over the porch on this side. So onto the details of, uh, of, the, of the construction of these panels. Uh, so the panels uh, are pretty standard. There's a lot of panels very similar to this. Um, they are built with uh, 
two by four, interior two by four, uh, structural framing, um, zip board as, uh, as an interior air barrier. Uh, that's to uh, the use of zip board. I know in, in the um, uh, in the passive house community is a little controversial. Um, in this case, it was actually uh, I think it was a good uh, way of uh, resolving the detail uh, because it's uh, it's actually both a sheeting as uh, and uh, as an interior uh, air barrier. Uh, so it helps a lot with avoiding any risk of condensation on the on the exterior or on in the sandwich of the. Uh, of the insulation uh, and uh, as a sheathing material. So there's no actual extra material that needs to be added uh, on top of it. So it was cost saving and, and performance that uh, drove that decision. Um, TGI outriggers, um, this house is kind of pushing the limit of how small a house can be and still be simplified passive house. This is, uh, uh, again, just short of uh, 1500 square feet interior area. Um, so the walls are really thick. Uh, are 60, 16 inches of, uh, of dense pack cellulose. Uh, it's driven both by the performance and by the risk of condensation. So both things uh, were, were in place here. And then on the outside, uh, the Solitex Mento Plus uh, taped uh, all edges and then uh, two layers of uh, furring strips for the, for the rain screen. Uh, the, the siding is a standing seam metal roof on uh, most of the exposed surfaces. And then everywhere where, where the house is protected is a, a Siberian larch. Uh, the roof, uh, for the roof, uh, um, also because of the uh, R value that we had to hit, uh, we decided to actually uh, put exterior insulation in this case. Um, so um, just not to oversize uh, the, uh, the joist on the, on the interior and, uh, and create additional structure that was, uh, that was unnecessary. So um, the, the, the rafters are um, 12 inches uh, I joist with dense pack cellulose and then on the exterior, uh, again, a zip board as our, as our interior air barrier. So there's no, the, 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 the dense pack cellulose, one thing that I wanted to highlight also with this picture is actually not contained by your typical Intello or any interior air barrier. Uh, so it's allowed to actually dry to the, to the interior. And uh, once again, the zip board is acting as the interior, um, interior uh, air barrier and uh, as, uh, as a sheeting. Uh, and then on the exterior, EPS, uh, um, and then on top of that, uh, again, Solitex, uh, in this case, Solitex UM, which is a membrane with, uh, uh, with a mesh on top of it. So you can apply the, uh, the metal roofing directly on top of that and, and maintain some circulation underneath. Uh, the slab, finally, uh, slab R32, uh, 42, sorry. Um, slab was uh, all uh, um, prefab uh, uh, EPS. Um, so uh, I think from easy, Easy, easy frame, easy, easy core, something like that. Uh, so, all pre-design was uh, as simple as uh, setting up a uh, 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 construction with Legos uh, to put it all together, um, secure it in place, uh, and then uh, prep it for the for the concrete pour. Uh, the windows. Um, so another, of course, important component on the on the facade. Uh, so of course, the, the main the main element uh, in the in the house is this uh, big double high space uh, with this big curtain wall. Uh, the curtain wall is a stick built uh, um, wood uh, aluminum curtain wall. So with wood mullions and uh, and pressure cap uh, aluminum on the on the exterior. Uh, the windows are all uh, aluminum clad uh, uh, pine windows um, from Batimet from Germany. Uh, these windows show, show a couple of things. Uh, this picture here show a couple of things that unfortunately happened. So the manufacturing was pretty good, but um, there were definitely some problem in, in some of the gaskets and how they were installed. So we had to fix that uh, on site. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the quality of the window, and, and I want to point out that it's really hard to find at a decent price uh, a welded, uh, angle, welded uh, face uh, aluminum window. And this, the, the, all the details in this are, were really, really great. Um, so some other pictures of the of the curtain wall, uh, just to show how it worked. Um, the the um, the curtain wall was, was over designed in terms of the depth of the mullion, uh, just to um, contain uh, the thickness of the wall more than uh, uh, just the structural load. Uh, so the so the horizontal member, the transom, uh, they're more than just uh, they're just the transom. They just they don't only support the glass, but they kind of become a little seat uh, at the bottom and a shelf on the on the uh, upper level. 
Uh, some details here also for the for this uh, for the curtain wall system. Uh, so this is the typical curtain wall, and then this detail. This is something that I spent a lot of time detailing. So because of this big extent of glass facing south, we of course wanted to um, protect it from ex excessive solar heat gain. So there are some shades that are hidden behind the behind the the siding in there. Uh, the shades are staggered. And I don't really. I look for an hour finding a picture of them, uh, and even though I'm not the house, it's too cold to actually run them now. Uh, but uh, they're they're stagger. They all work. I promise. Uh, they're all uh, they're all uh, automated. So so they're they're not. Uh, they don't have a sensor, but they but you can control them uh, remotely with the remote control. Uh, and they're completely invisible from uh, from the exterior. So uh, if we go back here, they're hidden behind here. One, two, three, and four, and uh, again, completely invisible from the interior and exterior when they're not uh, uh, when they're not dropped down. Um, so construction of the house, uh, everything went relatively smooth until March 2020, when of course uh, the pandemic hit, and uh, when uh, uh, there was a stop work order for uh, most uh, construction or, or non-essential construction in New York. Uh, so at this point, uh, uh, that, that's a picture from then. So the interiors were kind of all wired and all mechanical uh, systems in place, but of course no finish uh, on the exterior. We barely had started a roofing on the opposite side, uh, but not completed. Uh, so we, at that, at that point, it was, it was kind of like a lot of stress, but at the same time, a very fun experience. Uh, we just asked friends to help, uh, and my wife and I took more work than we were supposed to. Um, we, we were already planning to do some of the interior finishes ourselves, uh, but we decided to do a lot more. So we did all the kitchen, uh, we did the entire wood siding of the house ourselves, uh, we, did the, we did the floors. Uh, so the siding was actually a fun experience. Um, I have not really done a lot of woodwork, a, a few things, a, a few millwork, uh, fun projects here and there, uh, but installing siding for an entire house is a different project, a little bit of an undertaking. I uh, had to run, rent the tools like uh, this guy here, uh, but at the end of the day, it was fun. It was, uh, it was a ex uh, great experience. Uh, as an architect, I learned a lot by doing things, how to detail uh, connections, uh, how to, uh, well, what to expect and what not to expect uh, in terms of tolerances, in terms of uh, precisions of, uh, of the execution of the details. Um, so it was, uh, even though it was, it took much, much longer than anticipated and, uh, and a lot more uh, work and, and stress, it was definitely a fun, a fun experience and a, and a big learning experience. Uh, the floors, uh, please don't ever do floors yourself, uh, or you're gonna get very close to divorce. Uh, the stairs, I did those as well. Uh, then we did all the, uh, all the casing for the windows. Uh, so this is all red oak. Uh, we, luckily, uh, the couch was also very late. So we had all of the living room for ourselves. Uh, uh, to set up shop uh, and uh, and uh, set all of these uh, all of these boxes, uh, we built them on the floor and then installed them uh, uh, onto onto the windows. Uh, very proud of those. So uh, that was a fun project. Um, so here's the house, completed house. So the house actually won uh, the at the latest uh, FuseCon uh, the award for best project by a young professional. I was 35 at the time of uh, when I started the project, uh, but really the professional uh, I have to credit uh, him is uh, um, Owen O'Connor. Uh, is the he was the builder and uh, the the fields rater, and he was 34 when we started the project, so under 35. Um, so the house uh, um, again, the house is uh, now is finally complete. There are still a few things that we're that we're working on, uh, some furniture missing here and there. Uh, but uh, but overall, uh, we're really happy with the result. Uh, um, it's been uh, it's been great as an architect to have a, a project uh, uh, that you complete that you don't have to ask a client to to visit with the other potential client uh, is an incredible value, uh, and this has been uh, very successful in in getting uh, uh, our company new projects. Um, on the interior, some fun things. Uh, this table, something that uh, my wife and I designed, uh, and uh, the two legs here. There was an unfortunate mistake. Uh, one of the one of the builder actually cut the ridge beam too short, 
uh, or one of the parts of the ridge beam too short. So we had uh, a 20 foot ridge beam that was an expensive mistake for the builder, uh, but also something they didn't want to bring back home. And uh, so we just cut it in parts and give it to a friend who's a mill worker and they use it to, to build the legs of this table. And we still have some pieces now. We're gonna build more furniture there. Uh, more views of the of the house of the interior. So this big curtain wall, as you can see, uh, points the view really towards uh, towards the pond uh, on the side. Uh, on the interior, kitchen cabinet. This is the big double height space, uh, and then upstairs with the mini split unit. And we're going to talk about mechanical system in a, in a second. And then the interior, uh, the bathrooms. We we even though the house is uh, is modern, we didn't want to have. Uh, super modern interiors uh, and uh, uh, more and more we're, we're buying more and more furniture from uh, uh, auctions, uh, from uh, secondhand stores, et cetera, et cetera. This, this sink, for example, we built kind of the whole bathroom around it. That was the first thing we, we went to Zabrowski in, uh, in, in Kingston. If, uh, if anybody has been to Kingston knows that place. Uh, it's an architectural salvage place and really like a, a labyrinth. Uh, so we found this sink uh, from the 50s uh, from American Standard, and then we built everything around it, uh, ordered these, uh, these faucets from Italy. The tiles are really standard dull tile, um, but it's a really bright and very colorful bathroom that we really love. And then the other bathroom, uh, definitely more uh, calm in terms of colors, uh, but also really, really modern, but not uh, non excessive. Uh, more of the interior with the stair that we did. You see that there's one, if you're an architect, you know that there's one too many steps here without a handrail. We are planning to build something there, but uh, uh, it's not there yet. Uh, luckily, the inspector uh, didn't raise any question there. Um, so mechanical systems. Um, so the house, of course, uh, uh, we're using uh, ERV system. Uh, in this case, it's a Zender Comfort um, 30, 300, 350. Um, here are the mechanical drawings, uh, but it's all pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, intake in the in the in the bathrooms uh, and mechanical rooms and the exhaust in the uh, in the living spaces. Uh, because of this double high space and because of the of the um, construction system, we actually have uh, the supply and the return under the 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 ceiling uh, um, of the. Um, uh, of the kitchen, which is a little far. That's one of the lessons learned, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that too. It's a little far to cover the entire space, so we've we've had to to actually add a ceiling fan to to take care of that. Um, in terms of heating and cooling, the house uh, well for cooling, the, it's uh, it's just one uh, uh, floor mounted actually um, Mitsubishi um, mini split uh, heat pump. Uh, it's a nine uh, um, nine kBTU, um, so the smallest uh, you can get, and and still uh, over dimension for the for the system. For heating, though, uh, we also have an additional uh, uh, post heater, um, so it's the Stelpro um, that. Uh, warms uh, uh, the ERV supply air to 67, 68 uh, degrees, uh, um, which is uh, uh, four or five degrees uh, uh, on average more than, uh, than, the, than what it will come out of the uh, ERV naturally. And uh, that helps a lot actually keeping some of the rooms, especially the ones on the, on the east and the north, uh, a little warmer in the winter. Uh, for domestic hot water, uh, that's another thing. So this is a second home, remember? So, and it's pretty narrow. Uh, so after a lot of debate, uh, I decided to go with a tankless uh, uh, electric water heater, um, because again, I'm not using the water all the time, mostly on weekends, uh, and then sometimes it's there for, for a whole week. Um, and I think uh, I think it was uh, even though there's there's a higher load, of course, when uh, when you're when you're calling for some hot water, um, on the long term, uh, this is actually going to be less expensive than uh, even a heat pump uh, water heater because there's no there's no tank that needs to be constantly filled and uh, and kept warm. Uh, range hood. Uh, I'm going to talk in, uh, later about that. Uh, we have a recirculating fan, uh, very standard for under CFM. Um, probably not the best solution, but it works uh, enough for this house. Um, so 
in uh, in uh, after after the work was finally completed, uh, sometimes in uh, in May, uh, we uh, managed to uh, test the house uh, to achieve the certification. So we did the um, lower door test. The results were great. Uh, so air changes per hour, 50 uh, Pascal, 0.27, with a target of 0.6, of course. Um, so so really uh, really a very airtight house, uh, especially considering how small it is. Um, here are some data for um, the nerds in the call, uh, the ones that are interested in, in all the data. Uh, we can go back to this and, and take a look uh, in detail if you have questions. Uh, but basically, already from, uh, again, from, from day one, we, we designed the house with the goal to achieve a, a FUSE 2018 certification, um, and we hit all the targets. Uh, the, only, the only, I added a note, um, I don't know if somebody from FUSE is here, but uh, there was a lot of debate uh, with FUSE about the uh, offsite renewable energy production, so I needed to, to add the 2800 kilowatt hour um, of that. And uh, uh, FUSE, uh, I don't even know if they have changed the standard because of uh, uh, how stubborn I was, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, their requirement for um, uh, using a, a community farm, a solar community farm, rather than installing solar on site, uh, is uh, a, to actually purchase those panels. And instead, I had a contract for 20 years to use those panels, um, which is a lease versus a, versus a purchase. And, uh, and uh, after a lot of back and forth, that finally uh, FUSE approved uh, uh, this uh, uh, method. And uh, currently, that produces almost half of what is needed for, for my house. Um, so these are the data, and I wanted to point out some data here. For example, the total source energy, uh, 13,000 kilowatt hour year. Um, so because it's my house, uh, I can see the, the bills. Um, it's Again, it's a second home, uh, but I did, uh, nonetheless uh, I wanted to show some, some numbers and show some uh, uh, the energy consumption of the, of the house, because even though I'm not here all the time, and I would say probably approximately 20% of the time the, the, the house is used, um, the temperature, so heating and cooling, um, again, despite the fact that there's no, uh, no, no human load in, uh, in the house and no windows are open, but also no shades that are dropped down in the, in the summertime, uh, the, the temperature was kept uh, for, for the past year. Uh, the house finally had all the mechanical systems uh, already last winter, so, so it's been a year of, uh, of a running house. Um, so temperature kept at a minimum of 65 in the winter and a maximum of 74 in the summertime. And you can see here the consumption. So as on 2021, uh, the actual consumption was uh, um, just shy of uh, 7,000 uh, kilowatt hour uh, with an estimated of 13,000. Uh, half of that, of 46% of that was actually produced uh, um, with offsite solar production. Uh, so very happy with the result. Uh, of course, I wasn't expecting to, to hit the 13,000 because it's second home, uh, but on the last be, being half of that, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good result, I think. Um, another thing that, of course, we all uh, um, value, hopefully, in, in passive house is uh, air quality. Um, so I got myself a little aware. Um, not the best tool, of course, on, on the market is maybe not the professional tool. And it's kind of annoying how it cannot go back in time and, and extract the data uh, only a month. But I look at this past month since I was here the entire month um, and, uh, and uh, extracted uh, week by week uh, for the four weeks of, uh, of uh, December uh, the data from the house. So as you can see, this is the uh, uh, overall score, uh, pretty high from 91, minimum 91, uh, top of uh, 97. Of course, there are always some peaks and some low. For example, this 70 might have been me cooking a steak or something like that. Uh, there, there are such small things can actually affect dramatically the, the, the value on, um, um, on, the result, on, on these results. So, for example, if we look at the PM 2.5, there's a lot of peaks here and there, uh, not a lot of lows. Uh, and these, uh, uh, the, the TVOCs uh, and, uh, and the CO2, for the most part, so these are dependent uh, on uh, yes, human activity in the house. So cooking, uh, even uh, if, I, if I turn on a candle, uh, that affects actually the, the interior quality, which is, uh, which is really 
impressive how little it takes to 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 change the air inside the house uh, vacuuming is also something that lifts a lot of uh, uh, dust even though a lot is collected a lot of it's lifted just because of the uh, fan running um, and then uh, the temperature also this is pretty good the median temperature uh, oscillates a little bit of course uh, but uh, um, that also depends on where the sensor is located um, the data that definitely is not all green is the humidity um, so on average, the house is dry in, uh, in, the, in the winter. Um, and the reason for that is because mostly because, of course, uh, well, it's dry outside and uh, uh, the house not always occupied, even though we're talking about a month where I was here, um, and uh, an all air system to, to, um, to warm the, the, the house. So, of course, that dries uh, uh, also the air and creates uh, some... Uh, um, well, not problems, but uh, uh, below, uh, slightly below uh, ideal uh, um, indoor indoor humidity. So, some of the problems and and lesson learned. How am I doing with time? I have another couple of minutes, probably. Going good. Yeah, go go for it, Alessandro. Okay, perfect. So, these are just. I mean, I. I there's a million problems uh, and there's a, a million things that I've learned in this house uh, and uh, and uh, um, I, I like to point those out to clients and say like don't do it like that that was a mistake um, but a lot of those are small things uh, like I should have had a bigger overhang over over my entrance uh, and uh, and I maybe should have uh, thought of a way of, uh, of warming up the concrete at the entrance because it gets really slippery when it snows and the uh, ice uh, forms immediately on it. So a few things like that, uh, design uh, problems. Uh, uh, in here, I really wanted to highlight the, the passive house related uh, uh, issues that, uh, that I encounter. Uh, none of them is, uh, is, uh, is a big problem. And actually I'm on uh, the way of solving all of them, I think. Uh, but one thing, it was definitely distributed temperature. So the ERV alone, uh, even though it was tested, it was calibrated, uh, uh, um, Zender, uh, a wrap from Zender came here and, uh, and, uh, and uh, calibrated the system. Uh, nonetheless, we have, there's definitely a, 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 a difference in temperature that is uh, noticeable between the rooms on the ground floor on the east side, the bathroom and the, and the bedroom in here uh, are definitely colder than the rest of the space. Uh, and, uh, uh, the in the living room, the the well where we stay, well, we don't float in space. But of course, in on the on the ground floor, it's a little colder than upstairs. If you go on the loft, you feel definitely a, a difference in temperature. Uh, the reason being that the heating system, for the most part, is upstairs. Um, so the mini split is here. Um, even though um, this is set to only blow uh, down at the floor level. Um, Still, there's not enough air. There's not enough circulation to actually warm uh, the, the the rooms on this side, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, again the 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 lower part of the of this floor. Of course, heat tends to go to the top. But this is never a problem in the summertime. The summertime, the whole house is uh, as exactly the, the 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 same temperature. It's it's only something that happens in the winter time. So the solution, uh, there's two solutions that that I'm actually. Um, trying to install if, if I can get this uh, equipment, and, uh, because as you know, supply is a, is a problem everywhere. Uh, so we're gonna install a little uh, electric radiator in this room, um, 500 watt, uh, probably gonna be set at, uh, at the minimum temperature and it has a built-in thermostat, so it's gonna turn itself uh, off when we get to 72 degrees uh, to keep this area warm. Um, this really is only needed, I would say from uh, early December to um, probably late February, so for three months. And then this is a plug-in, so potentially we can even just unplug it and, and, and uh, put it in a closet, uh, but it's really minimal. So it's probably just gonna stay under the, under the window. So this is something, we actually had a towel warmer in the bathroom that was supposed to do the work of this. Uh, and then for budget reason, uh, and because of the, well, with the pandemic, there were a lot of problems with the electrician uh, suddenly having a lot of uh, other jobs more interested in this. Uh, we reduced it, we, we cut it out, uh, and that was a mistake. We should have kept another source of heat in that area because, again, being on the, on the no well, northeast, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely colder than the rest of the space. And the window being under the porch doesn't get as much uh, uh, solar heat gain. 
Uh, in this area here, instead, there was a very dumb mistake, um, and we use fan in uh, other houses with double height. Um, so I don't know why. I, well, I know why I didn't put it because I didn't want to see it, but that was a big mistake. And of course, we're going to put one now and uh, uh, found a nice model, which is actually not this one. Um, so it's here waiting for the electrician to, to install it. Uh, hopefully that's, uh, that's going to happen soon. Uh, right now, uh, I know that this is going to work because right now I have a very simple uh, uh, tower fan that I put it on the loft uh, and that's enough to actually create this uh, air circulation to bring that uh, uh, warm air from the heat pump uh, in, in the entirety of the space uh, and so that the median temperature is at uh, 70 degrees and, uh, and there are no problems. Uh, another, another, not an issue, but something that uh, could be improved, and something that definitely I'm, I'm trying to do different in the in the in the next projects uh, is the um, uh, range hood. So I have a very simple Alica um, recirculating range hood from the CFM. So it basically, this is cut out, but it's it's under here, uh, sucks the air, and then there's a little exhaust at the top. So it just recirculates the air like that. Uh, whenever I cook something uh, like a steak uh, or, or, or anything that is, uh, that is smelly or even humid, even cooking a pasta, I turn the ERV booster on. So the, the, um, the Zender has a booster that uh, increases the capacity, increases the fan speed. Uh, so more air is extracted and more air is brought into the, into the house. Uh, while this helps in, in keeping the, the smell low and, uh, and kind of like cleans the air pretty quickly, uh, after having cooked. Uh, still, there's a lot of humidity, there's a lot of condensation. Again, if you're boiling some, uh, some water here, uh, condensation happening underneath because this, the fan is not strong enough to pull it out uh, and uh, those peak in pollutants that I talked about earlier. So next house, especially if it's, uh, if it's a house uh, uh, where a family is supposed to live a full time, uh, probably a, a, a fan that uh, exhausts to the, to the exterior is, uh, is a better solution. And I know that then, uh, Kung agrees to that. Uh, so another thing is the humidity level. So that's another thing I talked about earlier. Uh, the um, in the winter the house is pretty dry. Um, now the solution here uh, for when I'm not at the house, uh, well I don't really have a solution, and uh, uh, and uh, I, I don't I don't think it's a big problem. We're talking about uh, less than ten, well around five to seven percent. Uh, uh, less humidity than, uh, than comfort. Um, when I'm at the house, uh, the solution is very simple. We have a couple of these. Uh, it's actually a diffuser, but it works perfect as a, as a um, humidifier. Uh, they will run at night. At night is really when we're not taking showers, uh, when, uh, when uh, you're not cooking, where the humidity actually uh, drops because uh, all that is happening is uh, um, the heat pump is running and, uh, and the hair is warmed and dried. Uh, so we just have a couple of these uh, in uh, in the bedrooms, uh, and uh, that's enough to really feel the difference. Um, I don't have a sensor uh, for the humidity in the bedroom. Um, I might move my aware uh, to the bedroom just to test it and see if uh, if this actually, beside what I feel, is also corresponding to to an actual comfort level, uh, much better than. Uh, um, than uh, what I have right now, uh, but it's a, it's a pretty simple and definitely very inexpensive solution. This is a hundred bucks versus a humidifier for the whole house that runs in the thousands of, uh, of dollars. Um, and that's it. Um, I forgot to mention this little guy. This was a great help for <laughs> during the construction of the project was our uh, stress release, uh, Spanky, uh, a little donkey living next door. Uh, Great friend, uh, helped us really a lot during the construction, keeping uh, our uh, mental health in place. <laughs>